welcome to the April 17th edition of This Week in South Carolina in Session. I'm Gavin Jackson here at the State House in Columbia. Well, Senate lawmakers just wrapped up their first session back here, back uh, in the State House on Tuesday. Uh, after they passed the budget last week, remember we, all last week we just saw uh, Senate budget deliberations for that $8.2 billion budget that just got read in the House today. Uh, we're going to get some more details about when a conference committee will be set up for that budget. We expect that to possibly happen next week because that's when the Senate and the House uh, really debate the differences between the budget and we really see them hash out those differences. Uh, once they come up with a real budget compromise, that gets sent to the governor and then they take up the governor's vetoes usually. Uh, so more to see on that, that's uh, still developing. But what we did see today in the Senate was lawmakers uh, again take up the VC summer bill uh, S-954. Now this bill would basically reduce rates that SCNG customers are paying right now for the failed VC summer nuclear project. Now that was a project between SCNG, Santee Cooper, uh, to expand the uh, nuclear reactors at VC Summer. That project failed, and law, but uh, ratepayers for SCNG are still paying for it. They're paying to the tune of about $27 a month, and this bill would actually eliminate that surcharge temporarily for right now until uh, the Public Service Commission can act otherwise. Now currently, uh, the bill was amended in the House to eliminate that, that entire surcharge, which is what the governor also wants to see done. However, Senate lawmakers have only reduced that amount to about 5%, uh, 5% instead of 18%, and lawmakers in the Senate are still debating about what to do on that. So uh, we saw some debate there, but we didn't see any action today. But we'll be seeing more and more since that bill is in priority debate status in the Senate, and that means it takes priority over other bills uh, currently on the Senate calendar. So we'll be following that closely this week for you. Also in the Senate, we saw in the Judiciary Committee today, uh, Senator Marlon Kimson's bill, S-516, which strengthens background check reporting uh, and also expedites background check reporting to gun background databases. Uh, we saw that pass out of the Judiciary Committee today. However, a key provision uh, dealing with extending uh, background check days was stripped out of it uh, by a nearly a cl a very close vote, uh, much to the disappointment of Senator Kimson. Now this, again, would have uh, expanded the number of days of, for background checks when someone goes to purchase a gun. Usually uh, people are instantly checked and uh, instantly approved for a gun. However, some people uh, get red flags due to past criminal history or other issues that the FBI then has to has three days to, to verify whether or not that person can buy a gun. If they do not get a response from the FBI within three days, that person can buy a gun. We saw this with Dylan Roof. Uh, the Charleston AM shooter down at uh, Emanuel Mother, Mother Emanuel AME Church uh, in 2015 who was able to get a gun despite having some issues in his criminal background. Now this was uh, stripped from the bill. Uh, Senator Kempson I did speak with later said that he's going to try and get this in the bill later when it does get to the floor since it's headed there. However, we have about uh, you know less than a month now for uh, bills to really start moving, especially if this has to go over to the House. Um, you know, we don't know the likelihood of this actually uh, getting it to the governor's desk, if at all, uh, even to the House this year. So more to come on that. But we do have some some comments right now from him and um, Senator Wes Clymer, who was key to removing that uh, that that provision from the bill. We also want to tell you really quick before we jump into that Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, I want to tell you a little bit that we did see uh, several lawmakers today discuss uh, what we saw over the weekend at uh, Lee Correctional Institution, where we did see seven inmates killed and 17 others injured. Uh, it was primarily a gang fight. However, we did see uh, it took about four hours for that whole situation to be uh, tamped down and, and uh, order restored out there at Lee Correctional. So a lot of lawmakers, specifically in the Senate, were uh, kind of talking about the situation, saying what the needs are. We definitely need to see uh, more money going towards the Department of Corrections and pay raises for those corrections officers, which has been in the budget before and is some, in some cases is this year too. But again, funding remains a top issue when it comes to the Department of Corrections, as well as uh, you know patrolling these inmates uh, specifically when it comes to cell phones and other contraband. So uh, but before we get to those comments, I want to just start off right now with um, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee dealing with that gun background check reporting bill. You know, the underlying legislation contains three components. The first is expedited reporting um, for actions in court that would have bearing upon someone's uh, ability to possess a firearm. The second is that study committee which we just discussed um, creating uh, new policies, procedures, technology, so on and so forth to implement the expedited reporting. And then the third part is extending the wait time at the point of sale from three days to five. 
This amendment would strike that third part, leaving the bill with parts one and two. And the reason I offer this amendment um, is twofold. As I expressed a moment ago in our conversation about the, the expedited reporting requirement, I believe that the most effective thing we can do to keep firearms out of the hands of, of those who legally shouldn't have them is work to improve the background check system and the manner in which data flows into that system by making it go faster. By, by um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say just anecdotally, it is astounding and confusing to me that, you know, I could get on a plane and use my debit card in Brazil this afternoon, and it takes several days for a law enforcement agency to, to figure out if somebody shouldn't have a gun, or I can send a, um, a package from my house to uh, Beijing and see at every step along the way where that package is, and yet it, and yet this bill w would, instead of trying to make our system better, just offer more excuse to, to delay um, as an alternative. And, and I just think we are, we are at a place technologically and informationally where the, the appropriate course of action is to work on expedited reporting and work on fixing systems, not delaying a, a law-abiding citizen's access to a firearm. Now, that over 90% of the people that purchase firearms who have to undergo a background check, those background checks come back within the first two minutes. I'll repeat that, over 90%. So what we're really talking about is less than 10% of the persons who undergo that process, I think it's actually closer to 7%, potentially having to wait 48 more days to carry military, 48 more hours. Thank you, Senators, for correcting me. 48 more hours to potentially carry military artillery on our streets. 90% pass or are rejected within the first two minutes. We are now talking about less than 10%, closer to 7% of people having to wait 48 more hours. Now, let me just read to you the categories of why people have, may have to wait a little longer. These are the prohibited categories of why the FBI determines that people can't have a gun. If you're convicted of a crime punishable by more than one year or a misdemeanor pub punished by more than two years, if you're a fugitive from justice, if there's a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence conviction, you're an unlawful user addicted to a controlled stub substance. If you're a state prohibitor. If, you're f you, if you have a protection or restraining order for domestic violence. If you're under indictment. If you're adjudicatedly mentally ill. If you are an illegal or a unlawful alien. If you've been federally denied or dishonorably discharged or you've renounce your U.S. Citizenship, citizenship. So those are the prohibitors, and we're talking about less than 10% of the people potentially having to wait an additional 48 hours. Most of those come back before then, but those are the prohibitors. And like I said, several senators did weigh in on the riots and fights that happened at Lee Correctional Institution Sunday evening into Sunday morning. Uh, again, it took about four hours for uh, those uh, fights to be tamped down by authorities. Uh, these fights did happen in three of the dorms at Lee Correctional, which is a maximum security uh, prison in Bishopville. 
Now, several lawmakers were talking about the need for more funding for Department of Corrections. There has been more funding for uh, corrections officers. However, like many state agencies, they are still woefully underfunded. And we uh, have seen reporting coming out of the newspapers looking at how just understaffed and how uh, dire some of the conditions were for these inmates. And we did hear from lawmakers and what they want to see done, especially uh, Senator Thomas McElveen, who represents that Lee County area. When he wants to see um, an investigation done into why this is a consistent problem, especially at Lee, uh, where we did see these seven inmates killed and 17 others injured due to uh, gang violence over territory in the prison, contraband such as illegal cell phones, and uh, just uh, cash also, and, and controlling uh, outside uh, endeavors as well. So a lot of different factors at play here when it can when it comes to what. Uh, fueled those fights at Lee Correctional, but here's what lawmakers want to see done to fix it going forward. I think if we had more folks there who could do those jobs to keep order in those prisons, then you'd probably keep, do a better job of keeping contraband out of there. And going back to the sheriff, you know, he's told me on several occasions, it's a matter of time before somebody gets, gets a firearm in that, in that prison. And when that happens, we'll be talking about a lot more than just seven deaths and 17 injuries. Um, so the thing that worries me the most is at some point in time, control was lost there. I'm not sure if that's because there were le too little employees or what, what the issue was, but Mr. President Pro Tem and Senator from Spartanburg as chairman of the Corrections Penology Committee, I think at the appropriate time, you know, the, the other members of the Lee County delegation will likely join in me and asking for some sort of hearing on this where we can have folks come in there and testify and tell us what went wrong, and what we need to do to fix it. Because this, this kind of chaos, this kind of unrest in a, in a very dangerous or potentially dangerous facility, we got to do something about it. We can't continue to allow this to happen. Mental illness of inmates is a serious, serious problem. 17% at population, 3,359. Chemical dependence inside the Department of Correction. Those who are on some type of drugs. Opioids inside the Department of Correction. Crack cocaine, other type of narcotic drugs inside the Department of Correction, 6,926. What are we spending to try to maintain that department? $447.7 million a year. Medi medical care, 79,000 inside of the department. Housing and security, and that's what I want to talk about today. Housing and security, 299,000 almost $300,000 of it. When you really pinpoint some of the concerns that we must address so that we don't have the same repeated kind of incident, it's in level two and level three. Medium security and maximum security. Maximum security, which is 36.8%. Medium security, which is 46.5%. This is the targeted area where we, we have, we've got the most concern. And I say to the Senate, we did a good job this year by trying to increase the pay. In minimum security, we pay about $32,500. Maximum security is about $34,596. We've got to increase the pay in order to provide better security. The House stood in a moment of silence for those killed at Lee Correctional Institution over the weekend and their families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, just want to take a minute um, without any editorial comment, but we all know uh, in this body the tragedy that occurred in, in my district in Lee County over the weekend and the loss of life that's, that's happened there. Um, regardless of a lot of other factors, those are people's loved ones um, and people who uh, work in that facility. I just asked that the House uh, have a moment of silence for all that are involved in that situation. Members, let's all stand for a moment of silent prayer, not only to remember those who lost their life in the terrible tragedy in Lee County, but in prayer for their loved ones who are dealing with this immense tragedy. And like I said, we did see senators debate uh, into the evening, but they just wrapped up today. Uh, that bill, S-954, that would lower rates for SCG customers who are currently paying about $27 a month 
for the failed VC Summer nuclear project. Now, they didn't take any action today, so I don't really have too much to show you. Uh, so we're just going to kind of mention that they did take that up. Again, we're going to be following this all week for you because this will be a top issue, especially since it is in special order status, which gives it priority over other bills uh, when it comes to debate in the Senate. So uh, stay tuned this week to catch some more. Again, we're here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 7 p.m. on SCTV's Facebook page, our YouTube page, and my Twitter account at Gavin Jackson. You can also check us out online at SETV.org, where the State House Daybook is there every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. You can find the video recaps there, and you can also find out what's going on at the State House when meetings are happening, and also this top State House news all in one place, and what's going on with the governor or the Supreme Court, which we do have several activities happening this week here in, at the Supreme Court and the governor, uh, his activities as well. So everything's in one place, easy to find and easy to follow, so you know what's going on at all times. Also, you can check out the South Carolina Lead podcast. We uh, give you a new one every Tuesday, which is today. So definitely tune in. You can find the links on scpublicradio.org or subscribe through your uh, Apple Podcasts app, which is right on your phone or wherever you get podcasts. Is that, that's the South Carolina LEDE, where we go behind the headlines and get some more context from the state's top political reporters from the Post and Courier and some of the issues that they're covering, as well as what's going on up here at the State House. So you have an idea, a little bit more context, a little bit more insight about what's going on up here at the State House. And be sure to listen to South Carolina Public Radio every, every day for news headlines, and on Fridays especially when Russ McKinney recaps the legislative week with State House Week. I'm Gavin Jackson for SEE TV at the State House.